What I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you uh, a little bit about our journey. And this journey uh, where we have now arrived at the station here, uh, the station where we want it to be. And uh, the trip of seven years is over. Yet, uh, the trip may be over, but the journey, the big journey, is not. And I think, Joel, you said that, Gabriela, you said that, I'm sure we'll come back to this. That journey is just beginning. But let's look at the journey. Let's look at what has happened over these seven years. Uh, first, maybe just to, to talk about a few things that have radically changed in these seven years in our world, the context. Uh, starting with the climate situation, and uh, in spite of incredible progress uh, in renewable energy and low carbon, zero carbon energy systems, the reality is that the climate situation has gone from bad to worse. That's where we are. That is part of the context. Geopolitics. Uh, we've had wars all the time, and in fact many wars that the uh, uh, international media like to forget about sometimes, but now two more wars have been added to that uh, in Ukraine and now more recently in Palestine. And uh, these take a lot of energy in every sense of the word. Populism has made uh, governing increasingly difficult in many parts of the world. And at a time when we need multilateralism more than ever before, uh, achieving multilateral objectives has become more and more difficult. Society has changed. Uh, we've had social media at the beginning of this exercise as well. But what has happened in the last few years is incredible. Uh, in terms of social media and how that affects the way society functions. And now we've added artificial intelligence to that and we don't even know how that is going to change. And then we had the pandemic. And uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, apart from slowing things down for quite a while and of course the human uh, uh, impacts, but the, 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 the whole questioning of science and authority has come out of that process, and that had also substantial impact on our work. So we ended up in something that's called a polycrisis uh, these days. The polycrisis where interrelated different crises are together, and it's very difficult to address one without addressing all uh, the others. And the challenge that we're facing, that these changes are, uh, they are taking away energy time and effort of government officials and civil society organizations to deal even with their own issues, let alone new issues, the kind of new issues that we have tried uh, to bring in. So that's been very hard. And uh, during this period of, of all this list that I mentioned, uh, actually um, most of these uh, impeded our work. Only one of them helped our work and for the wrong reason. And that's the climate crisis because the more the climate crisis went on, the more people started talking about these supplementary actions. And I, I think I'd like to add one more uh, point of what has changed uh, during these years is we have uh, lost a few people uh, in this process and uh, some are better known than others, but um, uh, they were all involved with C2G's work in different ways. Uh, we had uh, Pete Betts from the UK climate negotiator, he chaired one of our events uh, in London uh, early on. Uh, we had uh, Steve Reiner, who was part of our advisor group from the beginning, and he uh, unfortunately died. And we had two colleagues from Bangladesh who uh, left us uh, this year, early on, uh, Kwanrul Choturi, and more recently, just this weekend, Salim ul -Haq, uh, a, a really important uh, actor in this field. So I, I'd just like to thank them for their support. But let's go to our journey now. Let's uh, look at the different stations. And the first station was here in New York and in Copenhagen together. Uh, shortly after the Paris Agreement, uh, we were all feeling happy that, yes, of course, it's going to be great. And uh, yet, even at that time, even in that context, there were voices that were saying that, wait a minute, we in order to reach those goals, we will need substantial carbon dioxide removal. And nobody was talking about it. And some even went saying that maybe we might need even something more than that, like solar radiation modification. And definitely nobody was talking about that. And uh, so there, was, there were reasons to explore 
the governance challenges of these new emerging techniques. So there we go. I retired from the UN. I was going to live happily ever after when I got a phone call from Irene Krarup, whose name was already mentioned a few times. And uh, she's the head of the VK Rasmussen Foundation, a Danish family foundation here in New York. And after funding some academic work in this area, she uh, contacted me and said, would you be interested to set up a, an initiative to take the debate from science to policy, uh, from academia to policy, not ignoring science, but to uh, shift uh, the conversation. And it took me about 30 seconds to say, yes, I think I would be interested. And then uh, two weeks later, I was already in Copenhagen meeting the board uh, of VKRF. And I remember very clearly saying to the board that we're going to be walking on eggshells uh, for the life of this project, and we were lots of eggshells and lots of broken eggshells. Uh, and then, uh, very quickly, uh, CCIA came on board. Thank you, Joel. And before I knew it, I had an email address, I had a title, and there was checks being written for travel and other things. So uh, we got going. And it took us six months to uh, prepare and uh, begin to build a team. Kai, you were one of the Earth's first ones to, to join. And uh, we prepared a strategy. And in this very room, in February 2017, we launched officially uh, this initiative. So that was the first stop. And then the next stop was Nairobi. And uh, uh, from the beginning, we knew that UNEP and the UN Environment Assembly were key actors in this. And in fact, it wasn't one stop. It was many stops <laughs> over a, a few years, uh, from 27 to, uh, to 17 to 2019. And uh, we engaged with the Secretariat. We engaged with member states. We engaged with key civil society organizations. And uh, the long story cut short is that we managed to catalyze the first draft resolution on what was called geoengineering governance at that time. The resolution didn't succeed. The governments were not ready. But the action started and catalyzed substantial intra- and intergovernmental discussion that never stopped. And in fact, it continues uh, to today. And if now we turn the clock three years later, what we see is that, first of all, UNEP has published a very important report earlier this year on uh, entitled One Atmosphere on uh, the Risk, Benefits, and Governance Challenges of Solar Radiation Modification. Uh, and uh, in fact, that activity was the actual content of the draft resolution back in 2019 that governments were not ready uh, to adopt at that time. But also the executive director of UNEP uh, just uh, last month uh, wrote uh, to uh, member states in preparation for the next session of the UN Environment Assembly uh, and suggested ways of dealing with various strategic foresight questions. And one of them is how to deal with solar radiation modification. So things are moving. And uh, uh, we understand from uh, some member states that discussions now have refocused on potential action on this matter uh, in uh, the UN Environment Assembly. And then after the Nairobi stop, there were many stops. And I will not uh, uh, list all of them, but just a few intermediate stops. And I will just list the capitals that we visited whose uh, first letter starts with a B. <laughs> Bogota, Brasilia, Bangkok, Berlin, Beijing, Brussels, Budapest, and so on. And uh, these are just the ones starting with a B. And we did really a lot. Uh, but the next big stop was New York back in New York. And uh, because we, uh, in the meantime, we shifted focus. We started our work on both carbon, rem carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation modification governance. But we felt that uh, carbon dioxide removal was beginning to get on the agenda of governments, and therefore we could focus on solar radiation modification. And there were two objectives we had in mind, strategic objectives. One is to achieve some kind of initial consideration by the UN General Assembly and also consideration of the security geopolitical dimension of these issues by the UN Security Council. Uh, the latter, the Security Council, we gave up very quickly because the 
Security Council was becoming increasingly dysfunctional and we felt that uh, it would be just too much energy from our side uh, to try to get something going there. So we focused on our outreach for a potential General Assembly uh, consideration in New York and in capitals. And then something interesting happened. Uh, we were contacted by Belgium uh, because they were presidency of the Security Council in February of 2020. And they wanted to take this issue to the Security Council and ask for our views. And we suggested that, that in spite of our objective, that it would be too early uh, to take it to the Security Council and it might even backfire, and suggested that it should uh, instead uh, be an open discussion in the UN General Assembly. And it was accepted, the idea was accepted, and we uh, worked with the Belgian officials to develop an agenda, speakers, and literally the day before the invitations were sent out, uh, New York and the rest of the world closed, uh, closed because of the pandemic. And that's, uh, that was the end of that General Assembly discussion at that time, and we lost two years. We really did. Uh, we tried to keep busy during that time. Uh, Joel, you mentioned uh, the, 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 uh, the pandemic. I think we worked twice as hard to achieve half as, half as much uh, during that period, but we maintained pressure and we still managed to advance. And then we returned to New York and the capitals uh, toward the end of 2021. And then we had two years of really seriously engaging bilateral discussions with governments, workshops. Uh, Thelma, you were involved in some of those, uh, I remember, and others. And the debate moved. And what has happened is that uh, for many of the initial years when we talked about these issues, the issues were, is solar radiation modification good or bad? Is it going to save the world or not? Uh, the moral hazard, the moral imperative, all these different issues. But in the last six to 12 months, what we have seen is that governments have started talking about what are they going to do about it. And that's the big change uh, because, yes, those issues are important, but then they still have to figure out what are governments going to do. Uh, and that's uh, basically where we are. So. Um, then uh, I'd like to look at another kind of stop, and it's many stops, and we called it bubbles. <laughs> it was, uh, again, Kai who, who came up with this idea, because what we saw over the years was more and more things bubbling up that related to one directly or indirectly to solar radiation modification. We saw increasing media coverage very clearly, more and more articles, scientific, political, ideological, whatever they were, but there was really clearly increased. We had increasing number of intergovernmental organizations dealing with these issues, and Gabriela, UNESCO was clearly one of them. In fact, UNESCO was the first who actually contacted C2G, at that time called C2G2, the director general wrote that we want to be involved in this work. So that was quite interesting. But there were many others. Uh, uh, and I won't list them all, but there were many activities on that. And then we had the, the Overshoot Commission that recently published its report, which for the first time looked at these issues uh, of uh, governance of solar radiation modification, but together with other issues. And then we have uh, also civil society organizations that started either addressing these issues or new ones created, like Suchi's uh, uh, DSG, the Alliance for Just Deliberation of Solar Geoengineering, uh, that were created uh, to address these issues head on. And then we had what Gabriela referred to uh, in Mexico, uh, the Make Sunsets, a private company uh, doing all kinds of strange things and selling uh, cooling credits. Uh, however that works, but showing the, the, the risks of the lack of governance, that's what happens. And then all this time, the worsening climate. Month by month, uh, week by week, uh, the news got worse, and these bubbles just kept on coming. So here we are, uh, we're closing. Uh, and uh, one of the first questions that people ask us is why? <laughs> And uh, there are at least two answers to that question. One of them is we always said that we would close. <laughs> and uh, you know uh, we want to keep our word. And uh, we decided to set up an initiative, not an organization. The initiative was to be there until we achieve our objectives. And, uh, and then that's it. And in fact, 
more importantly, and that's the second reason, we believe that our mission has been achieved. Uh, governments are aware, and yes, people move. So some of the people who were aware, they are no longer there, so there has to be some kind of renewal. But, but still, uh, the, they know what the issues are, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to do more of what we have done with the impartial outreach, the way we did it, it would not have moved the debate further. Uh, it needs something else now. What is needed is advocacy organizations to either push for the use of these techniques or against uh, them, or if you're not sure, to explore them further until uh, one can come up with better decisions. And we need governments, very importantly, governments to face the realities and uh, uh, look at and, and consider the risks of an increasingly hot world that we are going to have and to look at the risks of the lack of governance and what that brings and, and then come up with long-term strategies to address these issues. And C2G as constituted, uh, it, it just had no role in this. So uh, uh, we had a choice to do mission creep, as they say, or actually in this case, mission change. And we said, no, we don't want to do that. So, so we close. Uh, our, the website and the information that we generated will remain, and hopefully it will be useful for some time to come. Uh, the processes we catalyze directly or indirectly are there, and, uh, and others hopefully will, will pop up, bubble up uh, in the future and evolve uh, whatever the future context requires. And my colleagues and I will all do different things, but I think one thing we, I can share, and I, I'm sure I can speak for the rest of my colleagues, that whatever we learned uh, during these seven years, it will stay with us in whatever we will be doing uh, in the future. So here we are, the final stop in New York, at least for this part of the journey. And uh, I would like to share with you a few thoughts on uh, what happens next, but I will do that after the panel discussion, if that's okay with you. So I, I will uh, stop here, and now we shift to the panel discussion mode, okay?